Welcome everyone to our CWE World Water Week event, Advancing Climate and Water Resilience in Cotton and Textile Communities. I am Brent Habig, Vice President for International Programs at the Institute for Sustainable Communities. I will be your host for the next 45 minutes and will also moderate the panel discussion. Our session today will unpack the relationship between climate change and water within the textile industry with a particular focus on India, the world's largest cotton producer. The textile industry is extremely water intensive, consuming the most water during cotton cultivation and wet processing. At the farming stage in India alone, the total water consumed is enough to provide 100 liters of water per year to 85% of the population. Water consumption by the textile industry continues to grow even as 54% of the country faces high to extremely high water stress. The dual climate and water crisis is not only an environmental challenge, it also puts over 50 million households in India who rely on the textile industry for their primary livelihood, including factory workers and cotton farmers. These risks disproportionately impact women who bear an outsized role in collecting water within the household. In response to these challenges, we will explore solutions that engage the private sector to advance the sustainability of the textile industry, but for solutions to be truly impactful, they must address the inequities embedded within the textile industry. So we will also share approaches to support the specific needs of vulnerable populations, including women and marginalized cotton farmers. We hope that these solutions can inspire and inform your actions in addressing the dual climate and water crisis. Before I welcome our speakers, I'll share a few technical notes. This webinar will be recorded and shared with all registered attendees for later viewing, and the recording will be posted on the CWE World Water Week website. We will have Q&A towards the end of the session. Please send your questions through the Q&A feature found at the bottom of your screen. These, these will be open for the duration of the webinar, so feel free to submit questions at any point. Please include your name, organization, and the city you are joining us from. Please note that the chat function is disabled, so if you encounter technical issues, please submit a question through the Q&A feature and someone will reach out to help. With this, it is my sincere pleasure to welcome our first speaker, Sarah Walker, Senior Manager for Water Quality and Agriculture at the World Resources Institute, or WRI. Sarah manages WRI's new aqueduct food tool, which is designed for the private and public sector to analyze water and climate related risks to agricultural production globally. She also leads WRI's global water quality practice and manages the water program's work identifying and mitigating water related risks and impacts on agriculture. Sarah will set the stage by explaining the relationship between climate change and water, and will then share the long-term trends and their implications on cotton cultivation and the, tech, and the textile industry. Sarah, over to you. Thank you, Brent, and hello, everyone. As Brent said, my name is Sarah Walker with the World Resources Institute. We are a global research organization working at the intersection of the environment and development. So to help provide some context for today's session, I will spend the next few minutes highlighting the water and climate related risks to agriculture, particularly the cotton industry, both globally and in India specifically. Globally, agriculture accounts for the vast majority of water that's withdrawn and consumed. Water for irrigation, livestock, processing, and other uses make agriculture a contributor to water insecurity. But it's also a victim. And under climate change projections, we anticipate increased water-related risks. Climate change manifests in water. Some areas will experience less rainfall or more variable rainfall. We generally expect increased temperatures across much of the world and an increased demand for water as populations continue to grow and develop. And like agricultural production generally, the textile industry is also both a victim of and contributor to climate change. 
Increased temperatures could reduce yields and increase pests and disease. Changes in rainfall could negatively impact crop growth. About half of cotton and 70% of all textiles are irrigated. So these crops rely on the availability of adequate surface and groundwater supplies. And according to WRI's new aqueduct food data, more than three quarters of irrigated cotton globally is projected to face high to extremely high levels of water stress meaning water withdrawals by all users are too high relative to the available renewable supply. And about two thirds of rain fed cotton is projected to face high to extremely high risks of seasonal variability, which could be indicative of more extreme wet or dry seasons. This reduced or more erratic water supply could threaten cotton production and the livelihoods of the 350 million people supported by the industry. So now if we take a closer look at India, the textile industry in India employs more than 50 million people and India is the world's largest producer of cotton. Like in much of the world, cotton in India is water intensive and it actually uses twice as much water than the global average. In India, we anticipate increases in temperature, droughts and shorter, more intense rain events which could hamper yields in some parts of the country. If you look at current data from aqueduct food, um, we can see that nearly all of cotton production in India faces a medium high to high risk of drought. And overall, WRI ranks India fourth in the world for highest risk of drought. If we look at other water risk indicators, both current and in the future, about one third of rain fed cotton in India faces high to extremely high risk of seasonal variability, again, which could be indicative of more extreme wet or dry seasons. When we project out to 2040 on the right hand side of the slide, we estimate that nearly 100% of cotton production could fall in this category. When we look at irrigated cotton in India, now and in the future, about 90% faces and will continue to face high to extremely high water stress. And overall, WRI ranks India 13th most water stressed country in the world due to its high rates of water withdrawals relative to renewable supplies. So if we put these future projection maps into a chart to summarize, we can clearly see that the vast majority of India's cotton production could face extremely high water risks in 2040. So to maintain production and livelihoods for the millions of farmers who rely on cotton to make their living, these water related climate risks must be mitigated. So on this last slide, I propose some potential high level solutions for the textile industry to help frame the panel discussions. The first set of solutions is around setting and achieving targets, which calls for a better understanding of water dependencies and impacts through footprinting setting targets for meeting sustainability thresholds and committing to industry certifications and standards, and investing in on-the-ground interventions, for example, to increase agricultural water use efficiency. The second set of solutions is around engaging farmers, stakeholders, the public sector, and the broader industry in collective action around sustainable sourcing and strengthening resilience in farming and mill communities. So I'm not going to go into detail on any of these solutions, but we'll hear more from the panelists about their efforts to advance climate and water resilience. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. These are very troubling projections indeed. You've made clear that India's water crisis is already severe and that action must be taken immediately. Thanks also for sharing potential mitigation and resilience building solutions. This is a helpful transition as we now shift to the panel to explore these solutions. With these formidable challenges in front of us, I now invite our panelists to share their experiences with actionable solutions that the textile industry can implement to advance the water and climate resilience of cotton communities. Our panelists will place a special emphasis on ways to support women who are more vulnerable to water stresses and climate change impacts. All of our panelists are leaders from the GAP Inc. and USAID Women and Water Alliance, which is a global development alliance between GAP Inc. and USAID 
dedicated to improving and sustaining the health and well-being of communities touched by the apparel industry in India. Through the Women in Water Alliance, GAP Inc.'s globally tested PACE program is being implemented to enhance the knowledge and life skills of women, to strengthen them as agents of change for water, sanitation, and hygiene. The program is also working to improve access to wash services at the household level and to advance water stewardship in textile communities. ISC is a proud implementing partner of the Women in Water Alliance, and ICRW is an evaluation partner of the PACE program in communities. Our first panelist is Dr. Prerna Kumar, Senior Technical Specialist at the International Center for Research on Women Asia. Prerna is an expert in program development, policy advisory, and impact measurement. She brings broad multi-sectoral experience and is an expert in climate change, public health, and gender. Currently, she is also leading the evaluation of the PACE program for women as part of the Women in Water Alliance. Prerna, welcome. Thank you, Brent. Lovely to be here. Our second panelist is Una herniak Hadziametovic, Senior Manager of Global Sustainability at GAP, Inc. Una also serves as the Deputy Chief of Party of the Women in Water Alliance. In addition, she supports GAP, Inc. sustainability strategy development focused on water, climate, gender, and human rights. Una is originally from the former Yugoslavia and brings her experience as a refugee to every role she takes on. Una, welcome. Thank you so much, Brent. Really nice to be here with you all. Our final panelist is Romit Sen, Associate Director of Water and Agriculture at the Institute for Sustainable Communities. Romit has worked in 220 districts, almost one third of India. He is an expert in the fields of water and sanitation, sustainable agriculture, and industrial and urban environmental management. He is passionate about working with communities and loves writing about his experiences and interactions. Romit, welcome. Thank you, Brent, and hi, everyone. Happy to be here. So I'll start with Prerna. Uh, Sarah at WRI has shared that India is on the brink of a water crisis, which is being intensified by climate change. Shifting gears from big picture science to household level realities, what are the implications of these changes on textile community households, especially on women? Also, what are some of the ways that we can support women such that we realize more equitable and resilient communities? Thank you for those very pertinent questions, Brent. Um, it's very important for us to recognize the fact that women within the household uh, and within the community, where are they really? Uh, I'm going to present today a study that we recently conducted with, uh, as part of the Women in Water Alliance with some of the PACE participants. PACE is essentially an empowerment program that is a that is GAP Inc.'s uh, flagship program. Uh, we interviewed roughly 1,500 women um, in three districts of Madhya Pradesh, India. Madhya Pradesh is also one of the states where cotton cultivation is high. And I think it's important here uh, for me to reiterate the fact that uh, some of the facts that Sarah presented, that India is uh, at the fourth highest risk of drought. Um, and, you know, water availability will be a huge issue as we go into the future. Uh, what's very interesting in this study for us was to find that almost 60% women out of the 1,500 were actually working in agriculture. Um, and today, what I'm going to present here is essentially data and conversation that we had with those women. Uh, I just want to lay out the fact that India already has over 70% rural female workforce, which engages in agriculture. And this, these are figures for about some eight, nine years old. So obviously we are looking at a big number. Um, and when we look at this particular group that we interviewed uh, as part of our survey, we realized that the ones who said that they engage in agriculture 
majority of them are engaging as agricultural labor. Only 19% recognize themselves as farmers. Uh, and that says a lot in terms of where women are. Also, the fact that most of these women, almost 91% of these women belong to scheduled castes, scheduled tribes, and other backward classes. Uh, and these are the groups which are anyway at the periphery of uh, and, and are marginalized in multiple ways. Also, if we look at the access to resource, one of the ways of looking at it is also to look at the education that these women have received. And what was striking for us was the fact that uh, over five out of 10 women had not received any education. But when we ask the question, who really bears the burden? Who really has the responsibility of fetching water for the household? We are not even going beyond the household. Majority of women actually bear the burden of fulfilling the water needs of the household. And what is very, very interesting to see is the fact that almost 60%, 57% women have to make three or more trips. Uh, women go, most women go beyond 500 meters to really fetch water. And on an average, a woman spends about 63 minutes per day to collect water. When we ask these women, what are the kind of difficulties that they face? Majority of them talked about how they have to go really far, uh, irrespective of the weather, they have to bear with severe heat, they have to bear with rain, uh, also drudgery, and long hours and long distance. But the ones who really have the responsibility, what level of involvement do they have in the decision making? Who really decides at the household level? What is very, very uh, disappointing um, to know is the fact that less than half of the women have any say within the household. Whether you look at the household needs, household purchase, purchases, uh, their own health care, decisions around their whole own health care, decisions around their own mobility, you know, most women do not have the right to decide. So while they, uh, you know, they, they have the burden, they have the responsibility, they do not really have the right. They do not even have the right to really decide their own earnings and how to spend those earnings. We asked women whether they think that they can really influence some of these decisions or whether they can really talk to their family members if they think the decision is not right. What's very interesting is that while most of them said that, yeah, sure, we can, uh, but one in five women face and fear backlash at home. And that backlash is pretty real. We also wanted to understand how do how safe do women feel within their own communities? And we found that about 16% women have already faced violence. And this could be anywhere from verbal to physical to sexual violence within the community when they venture outside their household. What's disappointing and what's very, very disheartening is to see that women bear the burden and they will continue to bear the burden uh, in the most difficult scenarios where the water availability is dwindling, but their involvement in decision making, something as simple as involvement in decision making within the household is very, very important. It's also important to discuss for us what do we really do? Because what are the solutions to then deal with it? Uh, I know this figure looks pretty um, uh, dense, but what's important for us to remember is the fact that while it is important for us to equip women with agency, equip women with life skills, equip women with other skills that can really help them move ahead, uh, it's also important to work with all other people. So the concentric circles that you see is the ecosystem approach which we at ICRW always believe in and follow because until and unless everyone changes, whether it's the household, it's the community, it's the systems, everyone would need to change to allow women to take their rightful space in decision making. And alongside that, when we talk about change, what kind of change are we looking at? We at ICRW uh, talk about the gender transformative change, which essentially means that the change does not happen only at the level of individuals, but the power relations, the dynamics has to change within the households, outside the households, within the communities. And also the structures have to change. The formal and informal rules that we all play by, they need to essentially change. 
Um, at the Women in Water Alliance, in fact, that's the beauty of the program, that where we are able to really keep the women at the center with all our solutions in terms of providing them the pace training, giving them the input, giving them and make, uh, you know, building their knowledge, gender perspective and skills. We also are working with men. There is a level of male involvement where we are working with male champions. Uh, also, we have partners who are working with the government, who are working with community leaders, who are make, making sure that we create those spaces within the community for women to really walk out of their households and feel safe and contribute more significantly and more meaningfully uh, to the lives that they are living and, and to the community overall. Um, I will just stop here, Brent, and happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Prerna for bringing this discussion down to the household level and for sharing the disproportionate challenge, challenges faced by women, as well as for sharing ICRW's ecosystem approach to more effectively support women. This is an eye-opening reminder to all of us that we cannot truly address and adapt to the impacts of climate change and the water crisis without centering equity for women. On to our next panelist, Una Hernia Kaziametovic from GAP Inc. Una, welcome. Uh, the Good combined right, climate you. and water crisis creates a major continuity risk for GAP Inc. How are you rethinking your business strategy to strengthen climate and water resilience within your supply chain, especially for cotton? Great. Thank you, Brent, and thank you, Prerna. That was um, such an important uh, presentation to have right before us because I think it connects largely into how we ground our strategy when we look at water stewardship and climate resilience for GAP Inc., uh, which we really see to be grounded in the intersection between environmental impacts and people impacts, especially as it relates to the impacts on women and girls as a result of everything you just saw in Prana's um, presentation, a disproportionate impact on women and girls as a result of the climate crisis and the water crisis. Women are also really critical to our business. Uh, they make up 70% of the workforce in our supply chain. They are also here at headquarters. Um, they are in our stores. They are our leaders. Uh, they are really just at the end of the day, the, the the reason why we can do what we do, but they also live and work in areas that face extreme water stress. Um, and this is a huge impact in terms of where we think about um, how we operate as a business. Um, because as a business, as Brent shared in the beginning, we do use um, a good amount of water. Uh, when you look at making a pair of jeans, for example, um, that is using about a thousand gallons um, of water in addition to the need of actually also needing water for cotton as you saw in Sarah's presentation. So with that, um, you know, we recognize that it's really integral for us to look at all of the pieces together as to where we can influence most as a business. So on this slide here, it's a pretty high level approach, but I just wanted to walk you all through about how we look at it from a Gap Inc. perspective in terms of what we can influence. First and foremost, we can work on designing products that use less water. Um, we can you know, provide information, life cycle analyses data to make those informed decisions. And we're also committed to sourcing 100% more sustainable cotton by 2025 as an enterprise. And I'll share a little bit more with you in a moment about what that looks like. Secondly, we focus on the actual processes. Uh, what can we do within manufacturing to reduce water by improving process efficiencies, by deploying innovation? Uh, for 2020, we had a goal to conserve 10 billion liters of water, um, but we know that that's just scratching the surface and there's a lot more work to do. Thirdly, um, given our big emphasis on women and water is really our focus around women um, and how do we uh, develop them and develop their agency by using our signature PACE program, which is a women's advancement program focused on topics such as communication skills, negotiation skills, but also WASH education um, and having that education to help women inform the activities that they take on the ground within their households and their communities to advocate for safe water access. 
And then last but not least is the importance of collective action. Um, this is really where, you know, we really see the opportunity for greater systems change, as you saw Prairadar talking about, and really emphasizing the opportunity that we have when we bring in different voices and different stakeholders to the table to, to drive um, that change. But to your question, Brent, um, you know, obviously the focus for us really around cotton and as a big cotton user as Gap Inc. is, um, how do we do that as it relates to reducing water and climate impacts from cotton? So we're looking at various types of investments um, that might include something like uh, investing in technology that can help um, let us depend more on recycled cotton versus potentially our you know, dependency on virgin cotton. It can include um, investments that we're making right now, for example, in, in conversion organic cotton or regenerative agriculture as well, um, as well as general organic cotton. Uh, but then it also allows us to leverage platforms like the cotton that we source through the Better Cotton Initiative, where we see huge opportunities uh, for us to integrate more water stewardship and climate resiliency uh, training and engagement directly um, at the farm level. Uh, to drive more change and, and better resiliency planning. Um, we've really been focused largely on that with our partnership with the Institute for Sustainable Communities. So I'm gonna let Ramit um, in his section share a little bit more about what that really looks like in the field. But then last but not least is really the importance about contextualizing the impacts around cotton. So as you saw in Sarah's presentation, you know, it's important for us to be mindful of, is this going to be a, dr a, a drought prone area or is this going to be a, a, a flood prone area and really being mindful of those changing realities so that those get integrated into our sourcing decisions. Um, so that's why it's really important for us to have resources like the WRI presentation um, to help us you know, move our business um, into a better direction moving forward. Una, thanks for sharing these goals, strategies, initiatives. It's all very impressive. You, you touched on sourcing. How are you integrating climate risk in your sourcing decision making? And secondly, what role do you see for collective action across textile brands to engage their supply chains in advancing sustainability? Great question. Thank you, Brent. So, you know, first and foremost, I think from a GHG reduction perspective, it's important to note that I think for some time we've been really focused on scope one and scope two, like what's really in our control and what can we do within owned and operated. But the bigger change and bigger opportunities certainly sit for us moving forward within scope three and what we can do within our supply chain. Um, so really depending on the uh, science-based target methodology to help us with scope three, we're really excited for the work that lies ahead for us as a company uh, to partner closely with our suppliers um, to really, you know, be on this journey together with them uh, to make greener choices and investments. Um, and we know that at the end of the day, they're such a critical part in helping us um, achieve that type of change. So from a sourcing side, it's really important for us to, you know, continue to emphasize and share and communicate what those expectations are um, from a people planet perspective with our suppliers, but then it's equally as important, I think, um, to really embed that into the way that we operate. And a lot of that depends on how we actually engage our own employees, um, not only in sourcing, but really within our portfolio of brands. Um, so one big thing that the team has worked on over the last couple of years is creating a really simple toolkit and training that can help our you know, designers and our merchants uh, really understand um, some of the trade-offs and impacts as it relates to people impact, land impact, climate impact, water impact of our raw materials. And we have a methodology in place that, you know, allows them to simply see, you know, where should we avoid and what are some good, better, or best alternatives for us to be more sustainable and to have better sourcing decisions. Um, so I think that that is really helpful in us in really activating our own employees um, to help us make those better sourcing decisions. Um, a lot of that is based off of life cycle analyses data and other inputs. Um, and we're certainly consistently reevaluating how do we add more data uh, to drive that type of information and make it readily assess accessible um, to our brand partners. But I think it's really important to highlight though that at the end of the day, 
these are all really, really, you know, great efforts that we're making, but we really are just one company. Um, so when you think of just the broader cotton industry, et cetera, um, it really takes all of us coming to the table together to really drive some of that impact home. Um, so, you know, I think the Women in Water Alliance between Gap Inc. and USAID is a great example of a public-private partnership where we have the government, we have civil society, we have women as agents of change, the private sector, our mill partners, you know, all coming together to solve issues as it relates to water and climate resiliency and cotton growing communities. But ultimately, I think, you know, there's lots of opportunities coming forward um, to focus more at that basin, um, uh, water basin area as a bigger area of opportunity for change. Um, so I'm really proud to share that through our work the last couple of years with the UN CEO water mandate, uh, we just recently uh, spearheaded the creation of the 2050 Water Resilience Group. And this is a really fantastic opportunity, I think, for companies to come together for collective action where we can really focus on how to be more water positive in all that we do in our business operations. So if you'd like to learn more about this, I know we're running a little bit out of time, but please check out ceowatermandate.org slash resilience. And I'm happy to also answer more questions about this and other collective action efforts in our Q&A section, because we do find it to be the most integral part of our strategy for um, success moving forward. Thank you, Brent. Thanks, Una. Companies like Gap, like Gap Inc. play such a large role in both the challenges as well as the solutions available. Uh, in the textile industry and it's very encouraging to learn everything you have going on whether that's internally via sourcing or via industry level collective action now on to our final panelist roma sen with the institute for sustainable communities or isc isc has worked closely with cotton and factory communities supporting them to reduce their water and environmental footprints while enabling them to adapt to climate change and water realities Roma, please share solutions that are working on the ground in Madhya Pradesh and Maharashtra in India at both the cotton and mill community levels. Thank you, Brent, and thank you to my fellow panelists for setting the context so well. Uh, the impacts of climate change is real. It is being felt by farmers, factories, and communities. Let me take you to Madhya Pradesh and Maharashtra two major cotton growing uh, states of this country. Cotton farmers are at huge risk because of these uncertainties in climate. Last year, farmers in Madhya Pradesh were on the verge of losing their crop because of the incessant rainfall. Whereas in Maharashtra, which is just across the border, farmers had to face a long dry spell during the uh, ball formation stage, which is critical to the productivity of the crop. We are aware that cotton is an input intensive crop. It uses large amount of water, fertilizer and pesticides. All this leads to increasing the uh, cost of cultivation. And with the scenario where incomes don't commensurate for uh, this uh, cost of cultivation, and if this goes on for a longer uh, time frame, farmers move into a trap of distress and poverty. I'd also like to bring in the important role of women played in cotton cultivation. Four major operations, sowing, fertilizer application, weeding, and picking are done by women. In the area that we work in Vidharba, we estimated that a woman on an average spends four to six hours in the farming operations. And if you add another four to six hours that she is responsible for managing the household cores, is responsible for the collection of water, you will realize that almost half of her day goes in taking care of the household and the farms. But she doesn't have the freedom to make decisions on farming, something that my fellow panelist Prerna also alluded to. Now, given this scenario, what is a pathway that will lead us to building the resilience of the farmers, enhance their productivity and incomes, and minimizing the impact of natural resources? And here we are talking about mainly uh, soil and water. At Institute for Sustainable Communities, along with our partners, we are demonstrating alternate package of practices. Now, these practices lower the use of inputs, thereby reducing the cost of cultivation. Now, as we demonstrate the value of these package of practices, we realize that the next step for us is to enhance adoption. 
Now, the biggest barrier in enhancing adoption is relating to behavior change because these are practices that have been continuing for a long period of time. However, through continuous training, demonstrations, extension and outreach support, we've been able to somewhat address the challenge. Next comes the issue of water. We all know that we realize the value of water when the well goes dry. We have been working with farmers to help them understand where their catchment is. Where does water come from in their catchment? What is the impact of the water that they are using on the communities living downstream? An interesting aspect in this is the whole point around water budgeting. Now, in the villages where we work, where farmers, uh, we made them do an annual calculation of their availability and demand and calculate a balance. They realize that more than 90% of the water use is used in agriculture and cotton is a major crop that's grown there. So the first natural step for them was to look at improving the water use efficiency in farming. And this was the demand side measure. Now, there's also this aspect that we have heard that, you know, cotton is a crop that's suited for conditions which are dry. But we, as we all know, that uh, there is generally a practice of, you know, putting in much more resources and inputs than what the plant needs. So water is a classic case. We also undertook supply side interventions to augment overall water availability in the catchment. And I am happy to share that the result of our store strengthening measures across the villages that we have been working have yielded 15.7 million liters of water. We are also working with 26 women self help groups who are now producing biopesticides and biofertilizers to promote the use of organic inputs in addition to generating income for their households. So what has been our impacts? As a result of our work, we have been able to uh, demonstrate and we have actually estimated that our work has led to lower GHG emission as a function of you know, lower usage of fertilizers, nitrogenous fertilizers, lower water footprint, in addition to achieving higher yields and lowering the cost of cultivation. Now, this was on the farmers and the community bit. In addition, we at ISC are also working with textile mills to document and disseminate best practices in water stewardship and pollution control. We are engaging with factories to develop long-term plans for water security by mapping their current water risk and developing a long-term plan roadmap through multi-stakeholder uh, collaboration. Thanks, Bromit, for sharing these results, uh, very uh, compelling results from communities in, in MP as well as Maharashtra. So if we shift then to scale, what is your vision for scaling these impacts nationally across India? Um, thank you, Bent, and that's a very pertinent question. There are three approaches that we feel can help, uh, you know, scale these initiatives. The first one is about creating a robust extension and knowledge sharing system. Now that can't happen alone. It has to happen in partnerships with institutions like the agriculture department, the Krishi Vigyan Kendras, agriculture universities, research institutions to scale the adoption of sustainable farm practices. The second aspect is around providing better market linkages so that farmers get assured and higher returns for their produce. We are building better collective by strengthening the farmer producer organizations and gradually working towards getting our farmers adopt certification schemes like the BCI and the PGS. And the third is around the convergence of water and agricultural programs of the government. Now, taking the example of India, there is perfect synergy in the objectives of the Jal Jeevan Mission, the Pradhan Mantri Krishi Sichai Yojana, the Atal Bhujal Yojana. As organizations working on water and agriculture, we need to support the government, work with them in scaling up, generating learnings, disseminating for long-term water sustainability and livelihood security. In the end, I'll, uh, you know, I'll end with a quote of a farmer uh, who says that better planning and effective utilization of water resources is key to securing our agriculture. Time demands that all of us work together to make our farming sustainable. Only then we'll be able to ensure the well-being of our families and secure the future of our children.
Thank you, Brent. Thanks, Romet. That's a great quote. And thanks for sharing so many solutions coming directly from the communities that we support, including opportunities to scale up to the national level via partnerships. So uh, let me take a moment and thank all of our speakers uh, for sharing your experiences and thoughtful perspectives. Thank you very much. And uh, we will now shift to the Q&A component of the presentation. Um, the first question I have is a question for Sarah Walker. This is from Rami Narte. And the question is, do you have similar risk baselines for Africa production markets? Uh, yes, thank you. Good question. Yes, in WRI's aqueduct food toll, we have um, water risk information for baseline conditions and future projections globally for cotton and for about 40 additional crops. And happy to help you offline for more information on that. Great. Our second question is from Elizabeth Isaac, Senior Research and Program Specialist at I4DI. This question is for Una. Elizabeth asks, Una spoke of, of the great value of collective action and working together, but I'm sure this also comes with challenges. Can you share what those challenges have been and how you best manage them? Okay, yes, um, certainly lots of challenges <laughs> can come up. Um, I'm going to pick on USAID as an example because I do see that Ella, my partner, is on the line. Um, we've learned a lot from USAID, um, a lot around the rigor of monitoring and evaluation and building out uh, theories of change that we've been able to actually now integrate in our broader sustainability portfolio of projects. Um, but we do work different at the end of the day. We are the private sector, we love dashboards, we love PowerPoints, we love fast information, uh, which might be different, you know, than what the government might be looking for in terms of um, longer documents, etc. But Ella and I, I think, have been working really well together to try to find a common middle ground uh, for a way to present that information. But I'm going to turn it over to her to see if she has any thoughts about challenges and how to overcome those from the with the private sector from USAID. Thanks, Una. Great pass off to me. <laughs> uh, no, I, mean, I think that's a good answer. It's definitely, uh, there's been a lot of challenges to get this alliance going. Uh, you see the full breadth uh, and depth of the work that we've been doing together. And it's been a long journey and it's been an enriching one really because from the USAID perspective, a lot of our work has really been, we put out a solicitation, we hire a, a an organization, an NGO or a firm to do the work. And in this particular case, we really have been co-designing with GAP Inc. Uh, and the partners for four months, some will say over a year. And so I, I would say the first thing is time and patience is definitely needed. Uh, if you don't have that, uh, you can't get this kind of alliance uh, structured. Uh, and so I would say that was definitely a challenge because all of us probably don't have any time to spare. <laughs> patients probably running out in some cases. And so I, I think it, it's key. And, and also that's just established the kind of relationship that Una then said where, you know, we, as simple as, can we accept a report in PowerPoint, which a lot of USAID programs actually prefer reports, right? A, a word die. So it's very simple, but this is also the first time that Gap Inc actually managed uh, a partnership like this. Uh, so it's a very new role for them. So a lot of it is really just understanding, uh, flexing a little bit on our bureaucracy because we're very bureaucratic. Uh, and, and I would say another challenge is really alignment of interest. Obviously it's important we aligned on outcomes, improving the well-being of women, improving water resources management, but how do you do that, right? And so it, it's really been important to have that continuous communication and discussion and it leads back to the challenge of time so I would say you got you got to have those as your as your ingredients uh, having something like this. Thanks. Thanks, Una. Thanks, Ella. I think a lot of the power of the partnerships is the differences across partners, but naturally that creates challenges. I think your advice around patience, clear goals, effective communication, that's all very helpful. Okay, we have a third question 
This is also for Una from Sally Weston. How can consumers via purchasing, say through uh, purchasing cotton clothing, how can they support the cotton industry in a more sustainable way? Oh, great. Thank you, Sally. I definitely think it's really important for consumers to remember the power that they have as well um, to ask questions, but then to also choose where they spend their money. Um, so I would definitely encourage consumers to look up um, what the brands are doing, what the company stands behind. Do they have commitments and long-term plans and do they acknowledge um, what they need to be doing around water and climate change um, and are they talking about what their investments are for better sourcing of cotton. Um, I know I can share a little bit about our brands. We try to make that um, more available and more accessible to the consumer, even on, a, on the website of a product um, that might explain to you a certain program that we're investing in. Um, I would certainly encourage you and other consumers to look out for those things um, and make sure that you're choosing the companies that um, stand with the values I think that you have as well um, as a means to continue supporting um, better sourcing of cotton moving forward. The more the consumer demands it, um, the easier it makes it for us too. <laughs> Great, thanks for that. Okay, we're almost at time. I'll squeeze in one final question for Romet. Uh, this is from Andrea Will. Uh, Romet, you mentioned the importance of behavior adaptation, or I'm sorry, behavior adoption, which, uh, which in the context of this, what are the biggest barriers you have seen to getting actors to adopt the desired behaviors? And how have you guys dealt with those behavioral barriers and or challenges? Thank you, Brent. And I think this is a very important and pertinent question. So as I said, you know, like we are talking about changing practices that have been in operation for a very long time. And uh, so, I mean, there are two approaches to it. One is of course that seeing is believing. So while we, you know, train farmers on telling them what those alternate package of practices are, we are also looking at demonstrating this in the villages in form of demo plots with their group of farmers. So we don't expect that in the first day, everybody will make that shift. But you know, when we demonstrate that in that same village, same, you know, area with all the conditions, that's, I think we use that as an, you know, evidence to influence people that yes, you know, these practices make sense. The second part of it is also that you have to build in the confidence. So when you go as an organization implementing a program, trying to bring in new practices, you have to you know, engage with say the agriculture department, the extension department and the agents, you know, bring them into confidence because they have been there for a very long time. So when you work together in tandem, building the confidence, demonstrating, uh, that's you know, one of the way to kind of you know, move the needle on adoption. Thank you. Well, we're already slightly over time, so let me quickly wrap up. I want to thank our speakers again, as well as all of our participants for your engagement and excellent questions. I would also like to thank CWE for providing us this platform to advance these important discussions. We've seen a wide range of perspectives coming from climate science, gender research, global corporations, as well as international NGOs. Across these diverse vantage points, we have full agreement on three key takeaways. Number one, the climate and water crises are real and can lead to devastating consequences for countries active in, te in the textiles industry, including India. We must engage urgently to avoid the worst projections with over 50 million households at stake. Number two, the dual environmental crises cannot be sustainably addressed without supporting the resilience of textile and cotton communities. To do this effectively, we must support the advancement of women's skills and decision-making capabilities. And number three, innovation and private sector collaboration offer powerful opportunities for mitigating climate and water risk, as well as for supporting the resilience of textile communities. We hope to see more of these solutions implemented at scale as is the case with the Women in Water Alliance. This webinar has been recorded and will be shared with all registered attendees, along with all of the speakers' presentations. These will also be posted on the CWE World Water Week website. Thanks again to all of you and goodbye. Bye, thank you so much, take care. Thank you. Thank you, bye. Thank you.